An absent-minded but hard-working professor called his biology class to order shortly after the lunch hour. Our special work this afternoon will be cutting up and inspecting the inner workings of a frog. I have a dead frog here in my pocket to be used as a specimen. He reached into his pocket and pulled out a paper sack, shook its contents on the table and out rolled a nice looking cheese sandwich. The professor looked at it, perplexed, scratched his head and muttered, that's funny, I distinctly remember eating my lunch. <laughs> a frog, imagine. Obviously, the professor had too much on his mind. Ever feel that you've got too much going on in your life? Apart from the frantic way that we live, another reason that our minds get so cluttered up is the incessant, noisy world we've made for ourselves. Just think about it for a moment. Remember how the jet aeroplane broke the sound barrier? Well, today, much of the music and movie, and movie industry seems to be bent on doing the same thing. Then there's the telephone. Yes, I will admit the telephone does have or does do us a good service, but it also has its downside. There are times when I wish it would just go away. In fairly recent times, we have been given another delightful invention, the cellular phone. If it wasn't bad enough to have a telephone in every room of our homes and our offices, now we can take the thing with us wherever we go. Then, of course, there's that delightful little relation to the telephone, the trustworthy beeper or pager. How did we ever do without it? You know, I always looked upon church as a sanctuary of peace and quietness. But in recent times, this peacefulness has also been broken by the unfriendly noise of beepers. Ah, for the good old days. Last, last evening, while I was preparing this talk, I wondered how we would survive if we were suddenly whisked back in for a few hundred years to a no-noise world. No phones, no radio, no TV, no beepers, etc. How peaceful it must have been. And can you imagine the opposite in that scenario? People who lived a few hundred years ago coming back to life in this generation. The noise would frighten them. They would think that we were self-destructing and in a sense, they would be right. For too much noisy noise can destroy our peace of mind. Do you know that many of us today can't work or play without some kind of noise in the background? Two texts from the Old Testament are very appropriate for this age. Isaiah 30, verse 15, In quietness and in confidence shall be thy strength. Psalm 46, verse 10, Be still and know that I am God. What is God trying to tell us? It's simple. Sit down and be quiet. I find in my own experience, when I feel frazzled and in a whirl, it's because I've taken my eyes off Jesus. I need to stop and listen to his voice speak to me through the word and through his second book, Nature. This does wonders for me. Walking by the, by the ocean or in the mountains, without our radio, of course, helps us to get life in perspective and helps our life in particular to get back its balance. Be still and know that he is God. My topic today is when the devil comes knocking. I just want to say a word about the Carter Report 3 ABN Crusade, which is going to be telecast live from this spot, commencing January 30, 1999. That's got a ring to it, hasn't it? 
1999. We're going to have our television truck and some other facilities out the side here. And uh, the folks across North America will be able to see this great crusade for Christ and truth right across North America by satellite. So it commences, God willing, January 30, and then it continues for a full month every night of the week. And so get ready for this great explosion in evangelism. The topic is today when the devil comes knocking. But you'd never guess it unless you knew what I'm going to tell you today. Is there really a devil, and what is he like? In surveys that have been carried out across America, most folk, almost everybody, most people, believe in God. They believe that there must be a great mind or a great source for truth and purity, that this must be found in a good God. But many, maybe most, do not believe in the devil. There are some mysteries, of course, that we need to think about, and that is the origin of evil. If there is an origin of good, then we would logically assume that there is a corresponding origin of evil. There's a mastermind of good, that is God. Is there not a mastermind of evil? I know that most folks have given up belief in the devil, but I want to read you this little poem that explores the origin of evil and if there's no devil, who's in charge of the evil? Men don't believe in a devil now, as their fathers used to do. They've forced the door of the broadest creed to let his majesty through. There isn't a print of his cloven foot or a fiery dart from his bow to be found in earth and air today, for the world has voted it so. But who is mixing the fatal draft that palsies heart and brain and loads the earth of each passing year with 10,000 slain? Who blights the bloom of the land today with the fiery breath of hell? If the devil isn't and never was, won't somebody rise and tell? Won't somebody step to the front forthwith and make his bow and show how the frauds and the crimes of the day spring up? For surely we want to know. The devil was fairly voted out. And of course the devil is gone. But simple people would like to know who carries his business on. If there is no devil, then why is there so much premeditated evil in the world today? Of course, if you believe the Bible, you must believe in a personal God and a personal devil. What's he like? He's not what you think he's like. He's a charming, intelligent, good-looking fellow who was unfairly treated by the big boss. If you met him, he'd be about the nicest guy you had ever met. He's not a bit like that nasty little man in the fire red suit with a pitchfork. If you met him, you would be impressed by his majesty, the devil. Would you please take your Bible and come with me to Ezekiel 28 that gives us a description of his infernal majesty. Ezekiel 28, everybody please, if you've got a Bible, turn to the passages. Ezekiel 28 and verses 12 and onwards, and I'm reading from the New International Version, Ezekiel 28 and verse 12 and onwards. Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre, and behind the king of Tyre was another being, and say to him, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. If you could see him, you would say, wow, what a good-looking guy. What a nice voice. 
You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone adorned you. Looks like he was into jewelry too. Uh, ruby, topaz, and emerald, chrysolite, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and beryl. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were prepared. You were anointed as a guardian cherub, for so I ordained you. You were on the holy mount of God. You walked among the fiery stones. You were blameless in your ways from the day you were created till wickedness was found in you. So if you were to see him, he's not that nasty little man in uh, that red suit with cloven hooves and a pitchfork. If you could see him today, he would be the most exquisite, the most beautiful angel that you can imagine. And the Bible tells us that he is more than a match for any one of us. Did you hear this? He's more than a match for any one of us. Don't challenge him in your own strength. Come over here to Revelation chapter 12 that tells us of his devious and successful ways. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7 and onwards. Revelation 12 and verse 7 and onwards, dear folks, that talks about this great being in his warfare against God. Revelation 12 verse 7 and onwards. And there was war in heaven. Michael is Jesus and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, that ancient serpent called the devil or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth, and his angels with him. And notice how many angels, verse 4, please. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. Angels are currently in. Almost everybody today believes in angels. The television series Touched by an Angel has been a hit. People believe in these warm, charismatic, helpful, fuzzy creatures. Angels do exist, and angels are a breed apart. They're distinct and glorious, and they are a higher order of created beings than human beings. They're very, very clever and highly intelligent. They're smarter than us. A lot smarter. But one third of these super intelligent, sophisticated beings were taken in by the super confidence man or the super con angel. The question that perplexes me is this that how could sinless, intelligent beings? with such mighty capacities to think and to reason, how could these sinless beings, possibly by the billions, one-third, we don't know how many angels there are, but most likely there are billions and billions and billions of angels to look after the whole of the universe. And one-third of them were taken in by the con man. Obviously, Satan, and his name was originally Lucifer, which means the shining one, son of the morning. Obviously, Lucifer presented some very powerful and persuasive arguments. So he exists, and he's beautiful, and he's charming, and he talks nicely, and he's very persuasive. 
Jesus, of course, never doubted his existence. When you read in the Gospels, you read on one occasion where Jesus was driven by the Spirit of God into the wilderness. And he was there for 40 days alone with the wild beasts, and he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And after this experience, Lucifer came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And Jesus said, in his weakness and in his humility and in his hunger, he said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the Bible tells us, of, tells us of the various temptations that Satan brought to him. He said, look around you. Let me take you high. You see the kingdoms of this world? They're yours. I can give them to you if you will but worship me. And Jesus said, it is written. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. And then Lucifer, growing more desperate, said, Cast yourself down from the pinnacle of this temple, for it is written, he can quote scripture. He knows more scripture than any theologian. He knows more scripture than any person in this church. He said, it is written, he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. Jesus replied, it is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Be gone, Satan. And the Bible says that Satan left him and waited for a more opportune time. So the existence of Satan, Lucifer, Beelzebub stands right beside belief in existence in God, angels, and Jesus. He is a real person on the wrong side. The Bible tells us that this super personality, because he is a real person, but he's a spirit being, carries on a vicious, unrelenting warfare against the Creator God. You will never open the door when he knocks and be confronted by an evil-looking creature. When he comes knocking, he comes clothed in the garb of spirituality. He carries on an unrelenting warfare against God and against his people. Would you please come to the book of Isaiah? And may I tell you today, he's got you in his sights. Isaiah chapter 14 and verses 12 and onwards in the Old Testament, in the prophet Isaiah, the Messianic prophet Isaiah 14 and verses 12 and onwards. And here it describes his devilish career. God says, start of verse 11, all your pomp has been brought down to the grave along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out beneath you and worms cover you. He's a detestable creature. How have you fallen from heaven, O morning star, O Lucifer, son of the dawn? You've been cast down to the earth who once laid lay the nations, laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly on the utmost heights of the sacred mountains. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. He said, I'm going to take it all over. I'm going to be the ruler of the universe, the ruler of the worlds, the ruler of human beings. I will be like the Most High and I will rule the world and I will rule the universe. It's interesting that the theme of Star Wars and some modern day movies copies this idea great battle that takes place in the universe, super, super personalities. 
and the forces of good and the forces of evil. It is the theme of the Bible. Of course, the Superman theme is based on the same idea. The force of evil and the force of good. And the force of good is found in a Superman who comes from another part of the universe and he comes to this world to grapple with the forces of darkness. This, of course, is the theme of the great controversy. Lucifer has got more weapons than you can imagine. He uses flattery and force and coercion and persecution. His greatest and his most successful weapon, however, is deception. Deception. Would you please come with me to Second Thessalonians chapter 2. The words of the great Saint Paul, who knew what he was talking about. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. As we talk about deception. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to come back to, to this chapter before we finish today. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 4. The Bible says, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4, He opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped, and even sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. And verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. For this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie. When I preach in Russia... When I talk about the great counterfeit, I take out a shiny new $100 bill. And I hold it up and I say to the Russian people, this is the genuine product. But here in Russia, there are at least $300 million of these circulating that are counterfeit. $300 million, at least in Russia, counterfeit, $100 bills. If you see the counterfeit, it takes a clever eye to pick the difference between the counterfeit and the genuine. Satan is the ultimate confidence man. And the Bible tells me, listen to this carefully, that when he said, I will be like the Most High, he was as good as his word. And he said something like this, if God has a church, I will have a church. If God has a system of teaching, I will have a system of teaching. And most people will follow my system of teaching because I'll make it so alluring that as I took in one third of the angels, I will take in almost the whole human race. And that's why Jesus said when he met him on the battlefield, it is written. Your only hope, my friend, is a clear mind that trusts in the word of God. I want you to come with me to the blackboard. And you can notice up, I've written here on the left side, God's truth and then the counterfeit. In my notes, I have texts to support all of these propositions. But you notice, number one, the Bible, God's word. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. The counterfeit is tradition, the teaching of the church, which is man's word. 
The Bible teaches in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and other places, the Bible and the Bible alone. The Bible and the Bible alone, not the teachings of men, but the counterfeit is the Bible as interpreted by the church, by the priest or by the minister, the voice of the church. The Bible teaches salvation by grace through faith alone. That is the great teaching of the book of Romans, the teaching of the book of Galatians. It is the theme of Holy Scripture. Salvation by grace alone through faith alone. There is a counterfeit that says we're saved by grace alone through faith plus good works wrought in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. That is the counterfeit as shown in the documents of the Jesuits in the Council of Trent. The Bible teaches repentance. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Repentance is turning from sin. I've been going this way, but I turn around. But there is a counterfeit that says, do a work of penance. The Bible teaches that on the cross of Calvary, Jesus carried out one sacrifice for all time. Read the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 10, where the writer of Hebrews chapter 10 says, one sacrifice for all time. The words are used once for all. But there's a counterfeit, the mass with many, many, many sacrifices when the priest stands before the congregation through the power of God as he believes it, the bread and the wine are turned into the body and the blood of Christ and Christ is offered up not once but a million times. I have here today an article by the most reverend Thomas Doran, the Bishop of Rockford, Illinois, USA. It's called Towards a, a Eucharistic Spirit. Let me read you just a few of the statements by the bishop. He says, This most holy body and blood are not present everywhere, but only in the Eucharistic species, that is, under the appearance of bread and wine. At the Last Supper, Jesus changed bread and wine into his body and blood and commissions his apostles to do the same. In the most blessed sacrament are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is called the doctrine of transubstantiation. He says, in union with his bishop, it is the priest who is the one person in the Christian community who has the authority or sacred power to change the bread and the wine into the body and the blood of the Lord. Catholics believe that the bread and wine once consecrated do not cease to be the body and blood of the Lord Jesus until the appearance of bread and wine are gone. This, of course, goes against everything that is taught in Scripture. At the Mass, we should give great attention to the moment of consecration. This is the time of transubstantiation when the body and blood and therefore the sacrifice of the Lord is made present. Now listen to this statement from the good bishop. Each mass has the same infinite value as his offering on the cross which opened the way to forgiveness for every human being. Every Mass, every Mass celebrated every Sunday has the same value as Calvary. That, of course, goes against everything that is taught in Holy Scripture. The Bible teaches the Lord's Supper. Jesus said, this is my blood, this is my body. Our beloved Roman Catholic friends say that by the power of the priest, the bread and the wine 
are transformed into the actual body and blood of the Lord. This is the doctrine of transubstantiation. But Jesus also said, I am the door. Was he a door? He also said, I am the vine. Was he a vine? We understand that our Lord was talking figuratively, but the church of Rome, through the doctrine of transubstantiation, makes the bread and the wine into an unbloody sacrifice, and Calvary is repeated a million times. It sounds beautiful, but my friend, it is indeed a great counterfeit to the truth of the Bible. Now the Bible teaches, this is the truth, that Christ is our high priest. But there's a counterfeit, that there are many, many earthly priests. And so people are taught to go to the earthly priest and there confess their sins. The Bible teaches the confession of sin, but to God. But the counterfeit is the confession of sin to earthly sinful priests. Come with me over here. The Bible teaches the truth of the holy seventh day Sabbath. The Bible calls it the Lord's Day, but there is a counterfeit. It is the first day Sunday that has no authority at all in Holy Scripture. None at all, not taught in Holy Scripture. It is an invention of the church. The Bible teaches the baptism of adults by immersion. The church teaches the counterfeit, the baptism of babies by sprinkling. These are great deceptions. The Bible teaches the new birth. Jesus said, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But Satan has a counterfeit. Just join the church. And the church will save you. The Bible teaches that the dead are asleep in Jesus. Jesus said, Lazarus is sleeping, Lazarus is dead. The Bible, the Old Testament and the New Testament teach the sleep of the dead in a state of unconsciousness until the resurrection. I can give you a hundred texts. Ecclesiastes 9, 6, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16, the whole of 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. But there's a counterfeit that the dead are alive in hell, in purgatory, or in heaven. This week, these papers were passed to me for my comment. Let me just do that now. It is a part of the great counterfeit satanic deception. Mary's touch. Over there in Korea and even the present Pope, God bless him and have mercy on him, is commenting on this, that over there in Korea, they have a little statue and it bleeds copious amounts of human blood and then special oil flows from the body. And there Mary has appeared not only in the statue, but she has appeared in the sky and she's come back with tremendous messages to the world. And the message is, I will help you. I am your true savior. I will go to Jesus, who seems to be a little indifferent, but I will plead with him for your salvation. And millions and millions of people are saying, Mary, and the Pope was saying this, Mary is alive. Mary is talking to the world. Mary is our co-savior. And they're seeing the sun, miracles in the sun, miracles in the sky, and many, many, many healings are taking place now in South Korea and in Mexico and in other places of the world as Mary comes and talks to the people. But Mary is dead. You say, Mary is dead? Yes, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that the saints of God who were living in the days of the apostles fell asleep. Now the teaching of the Bible is this. When a person dies, he doesn't go to heaven, 
He doesn't go to hell and he doesn't go to purgatory. In these articles from Mary, there are several pages about purgatory. And people are even now in these flames being purified because they were not good enough to go to heaven. That's a counterfeit, you see. The Bible says no person is good enough, but we're saved because Jesus is good enough. And I can be saved today, my friend, and ready to go to heaven right now. I don't need a purgatory because I have a Calvary, you see. The Bible teaches that rewards are given at the resurrection, but the counterfeit says rewards are given at death. The Bible talks about the destruction of the wicked. Malachi chapter 3 verses 1 down to 3 and further on. It talks about the, the wicked being consumed by fire. And the Bible says the fire is going to go out and there's going to be nothing left of the wicked. The wicked are going to be eternally destroyed. But the counterfeit says God is going to apply eternal torture. Most of us have never had the courage to think about that. Have you ever put your finger by mistake through a flame and instantly the pain is so great that you recoil? Think of your finger being held in the flame until it is burnt to the bone. And then your hand is put in the flame until the fat runs and cooks and burns. And then your whole body, and there's no end. And it goes on for a year, two years, and five years, and a hundred years, and a thousand years, and a billion years, and you cry, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, I'm sorry. And God says, <laughs> there's no end. So God, in fact, becomes the devil, because that's what the devil did. That's what the devil does. He tortures people. The world is filled with revulsion at the thought of Stalin and Hitler who tortured people and who murdered people. But the Christian world rejoices in a God who's going to burn people and torture them throughout all eternity. Also little babies who weren't baptized. Little wonder that Ingersoll said, if that's God, I hate him. Such a God would be worthy of our hatred. This is the devil's lie. All of these are the devil's lies. The Bible presents a picture of love and persuasion. It is my responsibility to persuade you to the truth. I will do everything I can to persuade you to the truth, but never, 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 never use fear or persecution. The fear of an eternally burning hell belongs to the devil. Over on this side here, you can put persecution, lawsuits, all of those things come from the bosom of the devil himself and his agents. Down here, my friend, you have the counterfeits. And he does it in such a way that people are deceived. Did you know, however, that we haven't seen anything yet? The greatest work of deception, his masterpiece, his crowning work, is still to come. Did you know this? We haven't seen anything yet? We've only seen just a little, little bit of fireworks. Wait, my friend, until the fire falls from heaven. Would you come with me to Matthew 24? Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24, and 15 and onwards. So when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation, Antichrist, spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down to take anything out of the house. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath. Isn't that interesting where it talks about the Sabbath? People tell me the Sabbath is abolished. 
It says, in winter or the Sabbath. Hey, is, is uh, winter abolished? Was that abolished when Jesus died? Come on, let's just think this through. Let's have a little bit of logic on this. Jesus is talking about the last days. He said, pray that you won't have to flee in the winter because of the cold or of the Sabbath. Why? Because it's God's holy day. Bless your heart. Can't anybody see that? That's so easy. Jesus said, pray you won't have to flee in the winter. You see, people read the Bible, a lot of people do, simply to get out of it what they want to get out of it. So they read a text here, pray that you won't have to flee in the winter or on the Sabbath day, and they say, hey, that proves Sabbath's abolished. Well, it proves that winter's abolished too. <laughs> doesn't prove anything. The Sabbath remains. So Jesus said when the Antichrist comes, there's going to be a test over this holy day, this Sabbath. So please read on if you don't mind. Pray that your flight will not take place in winter or on the Sabbath, for then there will be great distress, unequal from the beginning of the world until now, never to be equal again. If those days had not been cut short, no one would survive, but for the sake of the elect, those days will be shortened, praise God. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there he is, do not believe it, for false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and miracles to deceive even the elect, if that were possible. See, I've told you ahead of time. Jesus talked about marvelous miracles. Amazing signs and wonders. Jesus, my friend, spoke about these miracles. Bleeding Madonnas. Amazing miracles. Cancer victims being healed. And people saying, this is the work of God, when in fact it is the work of the great counterfeiter. If you were the devil, and if you had tremendous power, how would you try to get people in? By kicking them in the teeth? Or by being kind? So when he comes knocking, don't think he's going to be the funny little man in the fire red suit. Now notice, would you please come over here with me to 2 Thessalonians 2. As you turn up this passage, may I remind you also of the passage in Revelation 13, which talks about tremendous miracles and fire from the heavens, supernatural fire from the heavens. Now this refers to a counterfeit Pentecost, a counterfeit outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's in Revelation 13, verses 13 and 14. We're not going to read it now. But now come to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 1 and onwards that talks about the great climax in the, fi in the final deception. The great climax in the final deception. You ready to go? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ... And are being gathered to him. That's when people are gathered to Jesus, not when they die. We ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or letter supposed to have come from us, saying that the day of the Lord has already come. Don't let anyone deceive you in any way, for that day will not come unless until the rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness is re revealed, the man doomed to destruction. He opposes and exalts himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped and even sets himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. Listen very carefully. I'll give you a little bit of biblical exegesis. Many prophecies in the Bible have at least two applications. A prophecy will have a fulfillment and a consummation. It will be fulfilled and then filled full. This prophecy has at least two applications. It was fulfilled in the dark ages with the falling away, the great apostasy in the Christian church that gave this counterfeit system, this system of deception. That's what happened in the dark ages, you see. The great apostate church, church and state. But this prophecy is going to be filled full in the last days when Satan himself is going to appear in the church and counterfeit the second coming. The church professes to look to the coming of Christ. Satan 
is going to counterfeit the coming of Christ. Are you ready? Read on, would you, please? Verse 5, don't you remember that when I was with you, I used to tell you these things? And now you know what is holding him back so that he may be revealed at the proper time. For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. Listen, the secret power of lawlessness. Antichrist does his work in secret. He never does things in the open. His hour is the hour of darkness. He is a sneak and a fraud. So he does it in secret. The Bible says, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work, but the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. And then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. The coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved for this reason God sends them a powerful delusion so that they will believe the lie and so that all will be condemned who have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness listen to this one day you're going to wake up turn on the news as we do maybe get good morning America And the reporters will be overwhelmed with the news themselves. They'll say, a person has appeared at the United Nations or some other place. He's at the White House. He's talking now to Mr. So-and-so. He is Christ. He's preaching in the churches. Fast multitudes are gathering to hear him. The sermons are unlike anything we've ever heard. And there's a power with him. He's going to the hospitals and cancer victims are getting up, walking out. He's touching people and taking the diseases out of them. And he's telling us we're going to have a world religion that is going to be based upon the counterfeit. That we're going to have a worldwide church with a special day. And the dead are alive. The whole wide world is going to fall down and say, thank God Christ has come. Who will be deceived? Those who have not believed the truth, those who delight in wickedness, and those who refuse to love the truth. Let me express to you a deep concern I have for your salvation and mine. Already the world is being prepared for the great deception. People are being taught to believe lies. Minds are being manipulated by politicians, priests, preachers, and journalists. We can see this happening today in America, where the press so distorts the truth that the vast majority of Americans swallow it the distortion. They believe it. You cannot talk to them about it. They say, we don't care. Their minds close. A book has been written called The Closing of the American Mind. There is no nation that is being manipulated more by unscrupulous preachers and politicians than the American nation. 
and it's going to start. The great deception will start in America. We've been told this. What must we do? Believe the Bible. That's why I say to you, week after week, some of you do what I say, others of you know better than I do. I say to you, read your Bibles every day. Some of you do. Thank God you've been listening. Believe and obey the truth. Don't believe lies. Believe the truth. God has given you a mind for God's sake. Use it. Think. When John Huss was locked up in prison, before they burned him at the stake, he sent back a message to his disciples. He was the great Bohemian reformer, lived a hundred years before Martin Luther. He sent back a message and he finished his letter with the words, the exhortation, believe the truth, love the truth, live the truth. In the book of Isaiah, I've got a copy here, I think, of the New King James Version. It says this, right at the very end, God's people will say, this is the Lord. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. We will rejoice in his salvation. You see, there are going to be two groups of believers. Those who accept the counterfeit coming. And those who believe in the word of God. And who wait for the genuine second coming. There will be two classes. And the first class. The big class. Who allow the press to do their thinking for them. Or their church or their minister. Who are swept up with charismatic leaders. Who just go like dumb sheep to the slaughter who have never thought an original thought in their lives, but simply are followers. There they are. There are their teachings. But there'll be a little group whose faith will be in God's truth. And they'll say this coming is not the coming that we've been waiting for. We are going to wait on. And when Jesus comes in glory, they're going to say, this is the Lord. We have waited for him. My message to you is the message of John Huss whom they burned at the stake because he rejected that nonsense. This Roman Catholic theologian preacher from Czechoslovakia said to his followers before they burned him, believe the truth. Love the truth. Live the truth. The truth. Amen. Please kneel. My Father, my prayer th is that you will wake up this church and wake up this nation. And wake up the people who say they believe in this country. But Father, as we look at television and see the things that have happened in Washington and see how the people just believe lies and how characters, good people, have their reputations completely destroyed, help us, dear Father, to be people of moral worth, 
and help us to use the stuff that God has put between our ears. Not to be dumb sheep that follow journalists and politicians and preachers and smooth talkers, but help us to be people who've got backbones and people who think for themselves, who won't be pushed around, and people who have their faith down deep in the Word of God. Help us to be like the person or the people described by Ellen White when she said, the greatest one of the world is the one of men. Men who in their inmost souls are true to God. Men whose conscience is as true to duty as the needle to, to the pole. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who will stand for the truth, though the heavens fall. Make us men and women like that today. Take out of our souls, Father, this dreadful, wishy-washy, sickening, marshmallow religion that's got no substance to it and which comes from the pit. But help us, Father, to be Christians who believe in the Bible and who believe in reading their Bibles and who read their Bibles every day and who follow not any man except the man Christ Jesus. So bless these dear people here today, that when Jesus comes, we will say, at last, this is the Lord. We have waited for him. For Jesus' sake, amen.